I'm Arthur Shivon, uh, nickname Bliss. I worked also almost since the start of uh, the project uh, together with Frank and yeah, many of the others here. And um, yeah, so one, one of my tasks or yeah, in, in the next cloud is that I also maintain the Elder backend. And so I was also asked to do this talk here about the user management in Nextcloud. Um, you're going to cover a couple topics here. We're going to start slowly first with the uh, local, uh, yeah, with the local user and group backend, and, um, and then about the known LDAP one. Uh, it's going to be a bit more exciting maybe with SAML, which got a new open source implementation. And um, then comes a very new and very shiny stuff with a two factor of device or app passwords and the session invalidation for the users. Yes, the local user and group backends. So they probably do not make much sense for organizations who already have an existing user base or directory and just want it to plug into their next cloud. However, um, this is a very original kind of part and built in within um, Nextcloud, and it um, also kind of was uh, yeah, the first prototype or a template of how users and groups work with Nextcloud. So yes, back then, years ago, when it was implemented, it had also a very minimal approach. It was basically, as one example, just a username or user ID, and um, it was simply hard after the user creation. And only afterwards we implemented that uh, there can be a so-called display name. So you can change what appears to, to other users that you share with, for example. And, um, and this also was a necessity, for instance, for LDAP, what we're going to talk about later. Um, yes, um, where it might make sense, actually, in some use cases uh, while when using the provisioning API. So this lets you allow to write, write scripts for you that's gonna create or manage users automatically or with some other tools that you want to have. Yes, so this is the start. And uh, let's go to the other back end. Um, one question first, uh, who of you is familiar with um, LDAP and LDAP and Nextcloud. Okay, so that's already yes, it's a good a good share, fifty fifty, I think. Okay. Pardon? Pardon? <laughs> okay. So yeah, so LDAP is a, is a standard. It's called. It stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, I think, and um, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, use basically is kind of to have a directory for your users and maybe other resources like groups or computers or others and um, that you can kind of manage on a central point that you don't have uh, every service to use its own user management or you have different passwords everywhere and where it's just going to be a hell of management, especially if you want to kind of um, add users or remove users or modify one. So, and um, LDAP is a protocol and there are different, uh, different implementations. Open LDAP as a yeah, reference one and it's kind of the uh, most popular open source implementation. And Active Directory implements it as well from Microsoft. Also, this is widely used in, um, yeah, especially in enterprise environments. Um, so the LDAP backend as you wrote it, it's designed and intended to work agnostic of the server implementation. So we don't do any fingerprinting and try to detect what is actually running there and kind of work um, after this because it probably also won't work since LDAP is also very customizable with your own um, yes, structures, object classes. It's, well, um, for performance-wise, it cannot compete, I think, with the local implementation because it's just wired, and usually you have the database very close. So 
then it kind of depends how much you need to talk to your LDAP server and um, yeah, where in your network is the place and, and uh, what architecture you have in behind there. Um, yeah, but in fact, um, I think it's, it's not really feelable. So, yeah. So we do a lot of uh, caching there um, as much as possible. Um, what always goes live against the LDAP is uh, the login um, because we're uh, going to do the, the bind um, to verify that the user is allowed kind of to access this, obviously. And um, afterwards, uh, we try to cache as much as possible uh, by default for 10 minutes. And only if that runs out, we kind of um, fetch new information. Um, Typically, what often runs against uh, LDAP Live is the searches in the user uh, in the share dialog, um, because we also have uh, one feature there that you can uh, define the search attributes. So you can look in specifically for the surname and the last name, or email address as well, and other um, attributes that you specify there. And um, this we would cache as well. But if, there, if there's a new search, usually that would go, go live. Um, it, usually it, it works smoothly. Um, there would be one drawback. If you limit the sharing uh, to share within the own groups, because then there are several extra checks. And with many groups, this, this can take them some time. But um, yes, just for, for users, um, this probably is slower than local one, but um, not really feelable. Um, yes, um, uh, back to open LDAP and Active Directory. Um, so these are the most uh, yes, popular and most used um, LDAP servers. Um, what comes then probably is also a 389 directory service. And as far as I know, or last time checked, it also works there. And um, we, in the code, we also have some other ways um, or some, so some parts to support other servers. So we accept um, yeah, patches or uh, requests kind of to, to support in other way, uh, other server implementation, because sometimes there is really something vendor specific. And um, we are always going to try to find the capabilities of the server and uh, work with that. Um, what is new in um, Nextcloud 10 is an LDAP provider uh, that was contributed uh, by Lucy. And um, so her use case was that she wanted to have an application um, that can also write to LDAP because we only have uh, the read-only access. Um, but she wanted to have, be able from the user management page um, also to create users in the, in the LDAP server. And um, yeah, because we wanted, I mean, the backend is already pretty big code wise and we didn't want to add this actually. Um, so to have the, her own app um, being able to do this, she was writing an LDAP provider that gives you a connection um, um, for, for the, for, yeah, for, to, the, to the LDAP server and some other convenience functions so that you can yeah, start um, your own communications and um, implement this great user um, yeah, interface routines that you would need for such an app. So that the LDAP backend also does, of, of course, it supports users and groups. Um, and uh, yeah, we have some ways to, where you can configure it. Uh, so you can use LDAP filters and different bases for users and groups to get the, um, to get the yes, a, a search base as uh, little as possible kind of to be able to search the LDAP tree as fast as possible if, when necessary. Um, one thing it also does is that it detects member of support on the server, which in Active Directory is built in, for instance, but in Open LDAP, you need to enable it, and there you have also more um, control on where actually it's enabled, so um, that's a bit, a bit tricky there. 
um, but compared to the other traditional or more standard ways to um, to announce uh, group memberships in LDAP, this is yes way faster. And so, uh, if you run the LDAP backend against your LDAP server, uh, ideally you turn on the member of overlay in Open LDAP if you use that, and this will give you also some benefit. Um, what Saddleus also is working on is a password reset and a policy feature. Um, basically, also to allow a user to change his password if the LDAP server says you need to change it now because of uh, policy restrictions, for instance, uh, or because the password was just forgotten, I believe. Also, everybody new here who has never seen uh, the configuration interface um, is basically our, yes, um, wizard kind of. Um, you have this first server for tab that is open here. You kind of just give the very basic uh, details there, like the host name and the port, uh, the user binary and password and the base. And then um, when this is done, um, you will get already a green light, I believe. Definitely you can continue to the other tabs and uh, configure some specifics for users and um, the ways how you log in and the groups. Um, the very easiest approach is you just click continue, 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 and then it's already done. Ideally, you do click the test buttons before. Um, but yes, we kind of try to do this as easy as possible. Next part, uh, or any questions so far about LDAP? One on the uh, password reset yeah. uh, thing. Uh, that, that is a feature request. Please, please make that optional. Yeah. In large environments, you usually have some other meta directory that actually handles these kind of things. So you don't yeah. have people changing No, that's, that's definitely going to be optional. So that's nothing enabled um, by default or so. That was also one requirement. Um, there's um, a pull request also open on GitHub. Uh, yeah, it needs to be further reviewed or so. But this definitely is an opt-in feature, yes. Yeah. So it's possible to use the Yes. Yeah, that's that's possible. Is there a check that one user that is locally is not in LDAP? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so actually, I had a problem once, and I had two users with the same name and different UIDs. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. But well, name and UID. Um. So the UID. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what is being done is that is check that there is no collision in the UID because that's how the users are identified internally. So that means if you have already an existing local user, Joe, and you had pulled someone in from LDAP that kind of also re resolves to Joe, he will get a different UID. So in order not to clash it because what we try to prevent here is kind of to have users with the same UID and then one would be locked out from each other or see different content. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the problem. Um, there, I, we have to we have to problem. And uh, the problem is I cannot uh, determine which user has which file. Because it's in the same folder, the data folder is the same. Mm -hmm. Joe has the same folder with Joe. Okay. One sees his Joe's file and the other Joe sees Joe's file. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, of course, a configuration thing because probably you have uh, said the, um, uh, told the uh, home user folder to be created after the specific attribute. And that's why it's the same in the end. By default, uh, if you just leave it empty, it would have uh, the same folder name as the uh, user ID would be. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yes, uh, next on SAML. Um, this uh, or SAML authentic authentication. Um, this is usually, as far as I know, used mostly by universities, maybe financial institutes as well. I don't know. Um, yes, to kind of isolate the authentication part with the uh, user data silo. And um, 
Yes, for Nextcloud 9, I believe it was already that Lucas um, did an open source implementation um, for, for Nextcloud, and uh, this differs to the SAML implementation of OwnCloud, for instance. Um, mostly because it's here implemented as an application layer feature. That means it's not working um, via the Apache mod, uh, ship module or mod SAML module, but um, it's only working on, on the PHP level, which allows a far, far bigger um, flexibility. Um, so for instance, there's kind of no, no forced uh, lockout time, but it's typically 15 minutes. Um, but here we have a full control of what we can do. So on a request, we first check whether a session is existing, if not, whether a password is existing within the request, and if not this, then we go further or back to the IDP side to, to the authentication. And uh, it's tested with uh, yes, ADFS, Shibboleth, and LAM LDAP. And thanks, Lucas, for doing that. Um, Pretty new thing is a, a two-factor authentication uh, that was implemented by uh, Christoph Wurst. Also, I think, um, based on um, proof of concept of Lucas, I think I read it. Anyway, um, and this allows you to have, yes, a second factor when you log into your, um, to your next cloud. Uh, what impl is implemented now is, uh, as, um, uh, well, yeah, time-based one-time password, um, um, maybe also known under the term of Google Authenticator, I believe, and then SMS gateway. So basically, if you enable it for your user, uh, you log in, and then you're going to be asked for uh, the second token after your normal password. Um, this only works in the web UI. Uh, for clients like the Async client or or your mobile clients, or even other third-party clients, um, uh, device-specific password will be um, enforced uh, when this feature is enabled. Um, because we don't have the control over all the different clients yet, or can't have the control over all the different clients, and um, because of this, uh, we have the device-specific or app-specific passwords in that case. Um, yes, when you... Do you provide SMS gateway? Because I found it pretty challenging for me without having physical hardware for an SMS gateway. Uh, I, I believe, as far as I looked into that one, it's, it's using one existing gateway, so it's kind of an adapter to it. Okay, so you have a library of SMS gateway. Yeah. Okay, so after this app is enabled, an example of the um, time-based passwords, you can go to your personal user settings, and then there is going to be this point, and you can just enable a TOTP, and then you will have, um, you can just photograph this QR code, or use the secret there, and um, yes, provide it to your uh, TOTP app on your smartphone, for instance, and um, then after logging in, providing the normal password, you have uh, this uh, input field where you need to insert this code that is valid for a couple of seconds. I think this, no, this uh, mechanism is not, yeah. 
Now this mechanism, as far as I know, that is not bound to Google. So that's just, uh, I mean, this Google Authenticator, I think that's uh, just an example. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lucas, but it's, 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 it's an open standard, yes. There are open source apps, but that's basically the one that 90% of people use. So in the user interface, it shows Google Authenticator. Because if you say um, using RFC, whatever, compatible files, everybody will be bot, right? Yeah. And if you say something like uh, use compatible files to Google Authenticator, it will work, yeah. But you could also easily recommend one which is uh, open source. There is one from Red Hat. Um, there are, uh, Christoph, is, uh, I think on, on, on the repo you have written two, two apps, uh, which were they? I think the one uh, is named OTP Authenticator, it's an open source app for Android, available on uh, App Store. Yeah. And yes, I, I have a Google free phone and there's also an OTP app native one for this, so um, you're, you're really not bound to Google. And um, in this field, we also have uh, more improvements in the next Cloud 11. I think mostly they are even uh, done on uh, something user experience based and the other thing. Um, first, the generation of backup codes. In case you lose your smartphone, you still kind of want to be able to, to get back into your account. Then you need to have these backup codes. And uh, the other nice thing is uh, you to have the universal two-factor support, which allows uh, also logging in with hardware tokens, like for instance, this YubiKey, it's a uh, yeah, USB dongle, you plug it in and press a button on it and it just copies a token to your clipboard and you just can uh, verify by having this token that yes, you are the person who's allowed to log in. Uh, device passwords are already uh, mentioned, um, and this is also new. It's also uh, user specific. You also find it on the personal user settings. And um, basically, you can define a token for every other application you use that connects to the next cloud, or for every device that you use that connects to the next cloud. Um, so you can feed your desktop clients, your mobile clients, and any other calendars, etc. Uh, with such passwords that you can create in the personal user settings. Um, the administrator uh, can enable that they are being enforced. Otherwise, it's optional. You can use the normal password or even the token that's uh, generated here. The advantage is that if you lose your mobile phone or tablet or whatever, you can just delete the password and um, it's not able to connect anymore. Mm -hmm. Similar to this, well, similar, but there's a session invalidation. So you, as a user, you will also, you are able to see a list of active uh, sessions and um, in your personal settings. And now you see which browser is logged in, what is the current session, and you also have the chance to um, delete the session so that um, for instance, this browser here is not allowed to access your account anymore and would need to re-log in. And also this is helpful if devices are lost or in mistrust or so. Um, I think, no, it's not. So with this, you cannot exclude any user agents per se. Um, but I think this is possible on the server side if you just kind of use. Um, uh, hmm? Yeah. Okay. Um, either either if you have something like um, bent to fail, or you use a file firewall, which is a different functionality that you can. Uh, prevent different uh, specific browsers or user agents to, to access ne your next cloud. Yeah. Um, yeah then what, what I would like also to know from you whether you have uh, what, what expectations 
or wishes uh, are for you, what we would like kind of to see in the future next cloud. So uh, you are using the built-in, okay. Um, may I ask you why? We look at the data, the files grows too large, it's now one petabyte, and it's growing still. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're reaching limits of the files. So, uh, if we can have more and more data files, it's much easier uh, to do more. Is it, is it a way for you, or is it a possibility to migrate your users to, to an LDAP directory? Uh, yeah, sure, but for Apple, then just uh, have a little feature, but it's a micro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Maybe it would be great to have uh, an extra SNS, an identity provider for apps like Did you look into it? Well, we looked into it, but at the moment there aren't any names about this. So we, yeah. But we're always trying to contribute this as well. That's great. Pardon? Uh, uh, the question, yeah. Uh, the, the question was whether um, uh, the next cloud could get the ability to act as an uh, identity provider, like uh, yeah, OAuth, for instance. And uh, the answer of Lucas was that there are kind of no big plans. I think yeah, someone looked into it maybe, but currently there's no one working. But yes, pull requests are welcome. The problem with OAuth is that it's designed with a central server, a predefined server website with this endpoint is next flat to say Google or Twitter. And with a distributed setup like NextLab doesn't really work nicely with the system. It's more open ID is closer, but open ID is no longer used to the function But uh, so in a sense you are you are next out instance is your central server. Right? Yes, but like if an app provider needs to like specify which open ID OAuth endpoint you can use. So and for Google and Twitter, it's easy because you just have Google and Twitter. But for Nextcloud, what, uh, what URL is it? Just like the browser doesn't. It would be custom. Yeah. It's possible, but it's not designed for that. Okay. Do you have to outsource the other service to Nextcloud? To outsource the So you want to use uh, Nextcloud as an LDAP server? I want to use the LDAP server. Do you offer that kind of server? No, we don't. No. All the answers depends on the market. If you pay a lot of money, sure. <laughs> OK. Cool. Then thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm the whole yeah, time at the event, so if you have any other questions, Earlier or later, yes. You find me.